Hi guys, Phil here. Today we're going to be going through basic rendering to make your drawings pop. We're going to be going through the stuff that we went through in the very first of the rendering sessions at Cov University. Um, if there's anything that you missed, if you drifted off or fell asleep midway through my session, then you will be able to recap here. I'm going to be doing a whole load of screen caps like this. We're going to be going through the stuff that we did in the sessions just to um, give you guys a chance to see it all one more time in your own pace. I'm going to be working in Photoshop CC, so it should be the same as, broadly speaking, Photoshop 5. Most of the key combinations that we're going to be going through should be exactly the same. I've actually got a screen set up so that when I click on the screen, you'll be able to easily see it. If that's working, it doesn't appear to be. It should be. And when I press the key combinations, then they will appear upon screen. So the first thing I'm going to do is start working with this drawing that we had um, in play in the last session, which is a um, ghost trap from Ghostbusters that I've taken a photo of, or scanned in, bought into the um, system. So we're just going to very, very quickly go through the stuff that went through in the very, very first session, which is to prep this and get it ready for um, for usage. So what I'm going to do is pop the background layer out from the JPEG, um, make it into its own independent layer. And re I'm, remember that you've got to make sure everything has got uh, pimping title so you can keep everything tightly organized. I'm going to desaturate the image. Adjustments desaturate just here. It makes a very little difference on the screen now, but uh, later on, once we're working with colors, that's going to be something that's really important to use. Next, I'm going to make a uh, levels adjustment layer. You can see this histogram here indicates the pixel density for each of the different brightnesses. By dragging the white point down to the left, I'll be able to clear the grey from the drawing, bring the black line up. I'm going to try and get rid of as much of the um, pencil markings as possible. Because once I'm satisfied that that's reasonably correct, I'm just going to make a few quick changes using the dodge tool just here. I'll just make sure that I've got that set to highlights, exposure 20. What I'm going to do is just drag it over the areas where there's some level of noise from the pencil lines of the original underdrawing for the sketch. And note that I'm actually working on the pen lines layer just here. A few people had problems if they started working on the levels layer here. This will have no effect whatsoever. Um, I am reasonably satisfied that this doesn't look like a complete disaster now. Let's just zoom right in. Maybe make the blacks a little tiny bit blacker. up a bit of this mess just here. Cool, well it's certainly good enough for rock and roll now. So what I'm going to do now is click on the levels, press control or command on the uh, Mac keyboard and E and that will flatten those two layers down into a single layer layout, the pen lines. Okay, so I'm ready to go with this. I'm going to just click control shift save to make sure that it's saved into a place on my computer. So you brush with, that'll do, ghost trap. Number one, there we go, good enough. Right, okay, fine, everything's happy with that, brilliant. So, I'm gonna make my paints layer now, go to the bottom of the layers palette, make a new layer, drag it underneath the pen lines, and call it paint. Now here's something that a lot of people made mistakes with. The paints layer always have to be underneath the pen lines. No matter how we're working on almost all of the different aspects of these different projects, I'm gonna make sure that the pen lines layer is always at the very top. Now. To all avoid problems with um, the opacity of this level, uh, this layer causing issues, I'm going to make sure that the transparency mode is set to multiply. Okay, that's something else that um, bit a few people. Now, what multiply does? It means that any time that you paint on a layer directly underneath, the uh, the black or the dark colors are retained and the whites are rendered transparent. So you notice that I'm moving around the document by holding down space on the keyboard, switches over to the um, the moving, moving hand. If you press um, space and control, I think it is on the PC, space and command on the Mac, you can either zoom in or hold down alt and zoom out. Or if you just down hold and space, hold and space, flip it, out, space and control and click and drag left and right, you get this scrubby zoom. 
which is a really useful way for moving around the document. So the only reason I tell you this is because you'll save yourself a lot of time rather than doing what a number of people I've seen doing, which is using the key controls or just zooming in and out in single increments. So we've got the paints layer made just here. I'm going to make sure that the color palette just here is set to grayscale. Pick out 35 or 40% gray. So we're only going to be using a single color gray today, and we're also not going to be using the brush to do the filling in. Just to, in order to block out as much of it as possible, I'm going to select the polygonal lasso tool, which is this one just here. Make sure I've got the paint layer selected. Now, once you're rolling with um, with your painting like this, what you might want to do is press F on the keyboard. And you see that it jumps into a full screen mode, and then F once again just kills everything else. If you know what your key controls are, you don't need to switch out to any other tools for a little while, and that can be a good way of working. So I'm just going to click F again. Make sure that I've got the paint layer selected, the color that I want selected. So all I'm going to do is look at an outside surface. So remember, I'm thinking about where the light is coming from. It's coming from around about up here, down here, and it's going to cast this whole side into shadow. Now we're going to make a few concessions to our main goal, which is not to necessarily realistically convey exactly where all the shadows are going to be, but to convey what shape this object is. But what I'm going to do for now is very quickly block and select the outline of this shape. I may as well pick this bit up as well. So I've closed that shape, and now you can see it's selected with the marching ants running around the outside. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you press Alt Backspace on the keyboard now, what will happen is Photoshop will flood fill any selected area with whatever the foreground color is, which is in this case the 37% gray. So press Alt Backspace, and you can see that it instantly flood fills. Now I've got the paint layer selected, remember, pen lines over the top. So now all I need to do is go through and look at all of the different areas which are facing directly away from the light source that I've imagined. Okay, so that's the main large areas blocked in. There's going to be a few other sections that I want to fill in. So rather than using the um, polygonal lasso tool for, say, these very narrow sections just here, which would be a real pain in the neck just to super precisely go through, what I'm going to do is click B on the keyboard to select the brush. I'm going to press Control and Alt. <coughs> now on the Mac, it's the left mouse button that does this. On the PC, it's the right mouse button. Click and hold with those key combinations hold down. If you drag left and right, increases and decreases the size of the brush. Up and down goes from hard to soft, so hard at the bottom, soft at the top. So I'm going to pick a very small sized brush here. I'm going to click at the bottom of this very narrow surface just here that I want to fill in. Now I could 
try and manually paint the whole section up. Maybe you'd be able to do that quite easily if you're using a graphics tablet. I can't be bothered, so what I'm going to do is just hold down Shift and click at the top. And what Photoshop does when you click and hold down Shift is it does this kind of dot to dot business like this, which is pretty much ideal for what we want to do in terms of creating narrow areas of shadow. Now, if you remember my talking about this, the, the main reason for wanting to do this particular technique is to <coughs> not necessarily create a particularly realistic impression, but simply to give a little bit of extra information to anybody who should be looking at this sketch compared to using just the um, just the original sketch so already there's a certain amount of three-dimensional space being implied by the um, by the work that we've done so far so there's a few things that I want to block in there's a few little extra sections that I want to add in I'm just going to add some shadows in down here in a minute um, one of the things that is worth taking into account whilst you're working on documents like this is the certain visual cues I'm just going to reduce the um, spacing on this There are certain visual cues that people find useful to um, add in that viewers to the drawing will sort of instantly read as uh, helping to communicate three-dimensional space. And one of them is self-cast shadows. So, for example, this surface here abuts onto this flat end just here. So to communicate that to the viewer, what we have to imagine is if the light is coming down here, this top served cur curved surface is going to cast a shadow onto this piece of cornering just here, like so. So instantly that proximity of that surface is uh, much clearer to anybody who's looking. And additionally this object cast a shadow just here, maybe a little bit more than that, actually. And it's worth looking through your doc your drawing, trying to find areas where you can use this kind of self-casting shadow. So, for example, the edge just here is going to cast a shadow down here Let's switch to the brush and there's going to be a very narrow shadow cast but by this edge just here this section down here is going to be in shadow as is at the top of the wheels for example You notice that I'm not being super careful with this. If I wanted to turn on the accuracy, then I could do, but my main concern at the moment is just dropping in the um, areas of darkness as and where I think they need to be. So a lot of this geometry that's around this section just here has been much better defined now by the simple expedient of adding those self-cast shadows on. Now, that looks pretty good. There's a few little bits and pieces that I still want to finish. One of the things that we are missing out now 
are the surface details on this side just here. Now this is not an unimportant side, this is the, the sort of um, the largest front facing surface on the object and obviously there's a certain amount of geometry just here that needs to be defined for the viewer. So what we can do with this is simply to select the areas that we want to pick out and click the backspace button to delete the shade and for areas that we would have used the brush on click E on the keyboard and just use the eraser And again, it's not about being supremely accurate. I'm going to quite crudely add in some of these details, but the most important thing is just to make sure that the areas are picked. And what I was doing just then is something that sometimes pops up, which is this. If the spacing set too high, you can see the example just here on the um, demonstration brush mark here. If the spacing is set too far, um, too high, on any of the brushes, you end up with uh, what I call like the caterpillar effect, where you can see certain like bubbles and bumps across the surface. You want to make sure that it's down to zero when you're using a brush the way that we are now. So I'm just going to finish up some of these little bits now. Maybe add a little bit of extra shadow on. Just here. To help communicate this uh, this line. Well, I'm not going to get bogged down in the details here. There's, um, there's certain things that you may see on the surfaces here that are not 100% correct. And these small um, areas, if you want to be finickety about some of the details. But the uh, the main concern with working like this is not, as I said before, in producing something that's a sort of perfect technical surface, but in blocking out the broad swathes of the detail, which I think we're satisfied we've, we've managed to do here. If we're just going to turn the paints off, We've gone from sort of very flat areas here to this, which has removed some of the ambiguity in the geometry and I think does a slightly better job of telling anybody who's looking at the drawing exactly what shape it is. And like I said before, the, the main concern with working like this is to work pretty fast. Where this really comes into its own is when you've got a whole screen of documents that look like this. Um, a whole load of sketches that you've bought in from maybe one of your sketchbooks and you just want to make it pop and you want to just add a little extra bit of finish onto the document and um, and that's how you go from this to this now, in the next section we're going to be going through how to do the um, midpoint color and work in grey the way that we did in the second half of the session so if you join me in a completely different section of this YouTube video um, then I'll show you that and we can 
do the next awesome bit. I'll see you then then. Goodbye.